This is Omar Harb, uh, and I direct scientific outreach and education at the eukaryotic pathogen vector and host informatics resources, View PathDB. And as you uh, probably already heard from other lectures, uh, View PathDB um, manages a number of different databases for protozoan parasites, uh, their vectors, and for fungi as well. And many of these databases are listed here below on the website. And the website is viewpathdb.org. Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, Go enrichment, uh, Go terms, and functional enrichment analysis. And so this is just a quick short uh, lecture to um, give you some of the basics. So what is functional enrichment? Uh, and the best way to think about this uh, from a, uh, a standpoint of a biologist is think of Think that, or imagine that you have a thousand genes uh, that you've um, retrieved from an experiment that you ran, uh, and these thousand genes are upregulated in response to a particular drug treatment. Um, and then you look at these genes, and you notice that some of them have names that that tell you something about the function, like DNA polymerase one or gyrase. Um, but uh, but then you look at them and you ask, you, you look at this list and you think, you wonder, well, are these functional or G and these functions that I'm finding, are these um, enriched in my list or are they just appearing there by random? So in other ways of thinking about it, imagine you have a, a bag of genes and you, uh, you put your hand in there and you grab a thousand and you look at them and you see there's a DNA gyrase in there and you, uh, or, a, or a polymerase and you ask yourself, well, how, how often do I, can I pull this out by random or is it really enriched in this particular uh, condition? And so functional enrichment analysis really applies a statistical method, usually a Fisher's exact test, um, and allows you to determine whether uh, certain functions are enriched uh, or simply appearing um, by random in your list of results. Of course, remember we talked about looking at the gene names and inferring function from the gene names. And it would be wonderful if every gene has a name that is consistent and tell you some, some, tells you something about the function, but that's not the case, unfortunately. Um, and so it would be great if there's a way for you to associate genes with functions in a, very, in a consistent way. And, uh, and, and if you can associate that with functions that are really well described and are, um, and are used universally by everybody. And uh, this is where ontologies come into place, into play. And so what is an ontology? And for our purposes, um, when we talk about ontologies, we're talking about a formal description uh, of what exists in a particular field and the relationship between these things. And so in this diagram here, we're looking at the field of science, uh, which you can uh, break it down into three, um, or one way of breaking it down is into three um, sections, formal sciences, natural sciences, and social sciences. And then each one of these can be broken down into, for example, logic and mathematics for formal sciences. Natural sciences can be broken down into life, uh, life and biological sciences or physical sciences. And social sciences can be broken down into sociology. And there may even be relationships between these and, and each one of these categories obviously can be broken down further. And lucky for us, as, as by, uh, life and, and, and our people who are interested in life and biology uh, or biological sciences, uh, we do have an ontology that takes um, uh, that tries to describe the function of all genes uh, in in life, and this is known as the gene ontology. And the gene ontology, which which belongs to the life and biological sciences, uh, can be broken down into three broad categories, and those are gene ontologies that uh, refer to molecular function, gene ontologies that refer to the place where the function takes place. Um, you know, for example, on the membrane or in the mitochondria, um, and a gene ontology that refers to the biological process that a gene's function uh, uh, takes place in. And so uh, this is a bit more detail about these different, these three arms of gene ontology. So molecular function uh, really talks about the activities at the molecular level performed by a gene, like a toxin or a catalytic activity or transporter activity. Cellular component, as I mentioned earlier, talks about the location, like in the cilium or the mitochondrion. And uh, finally, the biological process talks about the, the process where these gene functions are taking place, like pyrimidine biosynthesis. You know, so if you, if you have a, you could have 20 genes all involved in pyrimidine biosynthesis. So now you know that you, these genes are involved in that particular biological process.
And why is Go Ontology useful? Well, here's an, here's an example. So uh, these are three um, categories or three um, um, biological features. So a cyanel is, a, is an organelle uh, that is, uh, performs uh, photosynthesis. You have a chloroplast. That's an organelle that performs uh, also performs photosynthesis. And you have the apicoplast that it does not perform photosynthesis yet. It is derived from um, uh, an ancestral uh, chloroplast. So there is a connection there. So all of these, all three of these, can be ascribed to uh, the Go term that refers to a plastid. Okay, so now you have a, a term that unifies these three different compartments. And so, so that's a nice thing. So now you can take genes that are that you find that are their function takes place in the apicoplast, and you can ascribe them to the function plastid. Same thing with genes that are function in the chloroplast or in the cyanol. So now you have a unified way of describing uh, the location of the function of these of these genes. And so now that we know that we can assign um, functions using Go terms uh, to genes in a, in a consistent manner, you can now start use, uh, uh, using these Go terms for enrichment analysis. And typically you will hear something called Go enrichment. So you're asking basically which terms occur more frequently in your list of differentially expressed genes, for example, uh, and of course, more frequently than by chance. Um, and so here's an, an, an example table that shows you uh, you know whether a gene has a, a genes have um, go terms or not, uh, and this is in your subset of genes in your experiment. These are the genes that are not in your subset, and then these are the genes in the genome. So obviously, the genes in your subset plus the genes in your uh, that are not in your subset will equal to the uh, will sum up to the genes in the genome, and you can start asking, well, um, how many do I expect based on what I know about the genome by random, right? And you can calculate that. And then you know from your observation how many you actually got. Okay, and you can do this for uh, every single Go term that you have in your in your subset. All right, and this allows you then to come up with a statistical uh, value for whether um, uh, whether this is uh, real or not. So you can get a p-value out of this to let you know whether uh, this is uh, this is something that occurs by random or not. But of course. Um, there are some caveats here. And so the Fisher's exact test will give you a p-value. However, we have to be careful because a p-value, typically you consider a p-value of uh, 0 0.01 as being significant. Anything less than that is significant. And that works well when, you, when, you're, when, you, when you're looking at a small set. So this is telling us that uh, one in a hundred of our results are gonna be false positives, right? So you're, you're willing to live with that kind of um, uh, uh, false positive rate. However, when you have a large list of Go terms, right, and this is, going to, this is going to be the case when you're dealing with genomes, you can have tens of thousands or thousands of Go terms, right? So now all of a sudden, your p-value of 0 0.01 means that you have at least 100 false positives in your, in your list. And of course, this number keeps going up and up. And the question is, are you willing to live with that kind of uh, false positive rate in your sample? And, and as your number gets bigger and bigger, um, the 0 0.01 um, p-value becomes less and less accurate and it becomes careful. So that's why you start, you apply uh, multiple test corrections. And this allows you to account for the large size of the, of the tests that you will be running. And typically when you see these, you'll see them as uh, Benferroni, uh, um, uh, corrections or FDR or adjusted p-value, they're called, uh, they have the very different names, but ultimately they will give you an adjusted p-value. And that p-value typically is not as significant as the p-value, the straight p-value you get from a Fisher's exact test, right? So you'll notice that the numbers are, are a little bit uh, more towards the positive end of the spectrum. So less significant, basically. So there's some caveats to go enrichment. Um, so of course the Go enrichments rely on the assignments that were made. So they have to be accurate. If they're not accurate, then of course uh, your results will not be accurate. So always be aware, where did they come from? So before you do an analysis, ask yourself, well, do I know who's assigning these Go terms? Were they automatically assigned or were they assigned by a person? Uh, if they were assigned by a person, how did they, what ter what, how did they do this? Uh, if they were assigned automatically, what method was was used? Was was Interpro, you know, 
um, um, Interpo to Go assignments used, for example, that's an automatic way, or was it simply by blast similarity? And if it was similar to a gene out there that has a Go term, but you just transferred the Go term. Uh, so those are, those are all things that are, that are good to know. The other thing to note is that Go term assignments um, is not complete, right? There aren't, uh, you know, there will be many genes in your genome that don't have Go term assignments. Okay, so this means that um, when you do your enrichment, you're really missing a big portion of the genome. So that's something to keep in mind. It doesn't negate your Go enrichment, but it's something to keep in mind that there will be many genes in the genome that you don't know anything about. They have no Go terms. And you really, the goal enrichment is not going to help you with those unknown genes. Okay, so that's something to keep in to keep in mind. All right, so with that, um, the next thing to show you is what the results look like in ViewPathDB. So the exercise that's that's associated with this lecture will walk you through the process of um, running a search and then uh, doing a goal enrichment on your results. And when you run your Go enrichment, you will get a table like this with multiple columns. You will see a column here for the Go ID, um, uh, the Go term. So for example, this Go ID is associated with serine type endopeptidase activity. You'll get a column here that tells you the number of genes in the background, which is the genome in this case. You have 18 here, which is the number of genes in your, in your subset. Um, and then there are various calculations on this based on, on these numbers. So what is the percent of your enrichment? Uh, what is the full change enrichment, um, the p-value. This is the p-value you get from a Fisher's exact test. And then these Benjamini and uh, Benferroni uh, corrections, uh, those are the corrected p-values. So you'll notice, as I was mentioning before, here's the p-value from Fisher's exact test. So it's times 10 to the minus 11, whereas the Benjamini and Benferroni are lower. They're times 10 to the minus 9, right? So they're, they're less significant. These numbers are obviously all very significant, so I would be very happy with saying that this Go term is enriched in my subset, uh, but always look at the corrected p-values when you do your analysis. All right, with that, I will end this lecture. If you have any questions, obviously, let us contact us at um, uh, viewpathgb.org, and we're more than happy to help you uh, with your work and answer any questions. Thank you.